So picture this, you're cruising at 41,000 feet on a brand new airliner when bam, both engines just turn off. Now, this wasn't because of some maintenance issue or bird strike, the plane just ran out of fuel, all because somebody screwed up a basic math problem. And yet it didn't crash, it glided for miles because, well, it's not like the movies, planes can actually lose their engines and stay in the air for quite a while. The pilots see an old military base and decide it's their best option to put down this 132 ton paperweight. It's one of the wildest true stories in aviation history. They call it the Gimli Glider. I'm Gary B. And I'm Big Man. Let's break this down. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to take off with Gary B. Pilot. Let's go! It's July 23rd, 1983. Air Canada Flight 143 is prepping for a routine run between Montreal and Edmonton. The plane is a brand new Boeing 767. The 767 was so new at this point that it had only been in operation for less than a year. The only problem? The fuel gauge wasn't working. Pilot moment here. Now you'd think, hey, we'll just fix it. But nope, they decided to MEL it and calculate the fuel manually. MEL stands for maintenance and later. No. Mostly everything's lying. Might explode later. You know, Big Mac, you're not even supposed to be in my pilot cam moment, so maybe you should just stick to uh, airspace and radar vectors. MEL stands for minimum equipment list. This legally allows airplanes to fly with certain parts of the plane that are inoperative. It's common practice and planes fly with MELs every day. Normally, this would have been fine, except like all problems in life, you can blame England. You see, Canada had just switched from imperial to metric, and the fuelers used pounds instead of kilograms. One kilo equals roughly 2.2 pounds, so if you use pounds instead of kilograms, you're going to get less than half the fuel you need, which is exactly what happened. Only time I trust metric is with nine millimeter, and maybe an eighth of herbal medicine. Big Mac, don't you get drug tested as an air traffic controller? Hey, I said maybe. Yeah, okay, anyways. That tiny math mistake was about to set off one of the most chaotic landings ever pulled off in a commercial jet. So now Flight 143 is on its way to Edmonton and nobody knows they have less than half the fuel they need. At the helm of the ship is Captain Bob Pearson and First Officer Maurice Quinton Tall, former Air Force. So at this point, the pilots are at cruise, probably talking about maple syrup and hockey when bam, warning chime. One of the engines just cuts out. Now. An engine failure is bad, but it's something we train for. Commercial jets can fly just fine on a single engine. They start diverting to Winnipeg and begin running their emergency procedures. Not really a time to panic. Then, boom, second chime, the other engine dies. And the pilots are all like, oh shit, what the fuck, eh? Jets don't just fall out of the sky. Even with no engines, jets can glide for a long time. At 41,000 feet, a Boeing 767 has a glide range of about 80 to 100 miles. For reference, that means you could glide from the top of San Diego all the way down to Los Angeles with no power. Having said that, you have to manage that energy pretty well by constantly trading airspeed for altitude or you'll stall. Double engine failures aren't something pilots normally train for. And even so, running the double engine failure checklist won't help you much when you're out of fuel. Most commercial jets have something called a RAT. But no, I'm not talking about Takashi 69. It stands for Ram Air Turbine. Basically, if the plane loses all power, this little propeller drops out from the fuselage and uses airspeed to generate enough electricity to keep a few essential systems running. Wait, the plane's powered by wind now? Might as well call AOC to fly the damn thing. Well, it's a backup system, Big Mac. Still sounds like one of them climate scams. Yeah, except in this case, it's literally the only thing keeping the plane supplied with power. Well, I mean, I, I didn't say all wind was bad. Oh, so you're pro wind now? I'm pro not dying. Exactly, back to the 7-6. Back in the cockpit, the pilots aren't having the easiest day. They've lost their main electrical system, most of their instruments, and the autopilot is gone. The pilots decide they're gonna try and make it to Winnipeg, but as they get closer, it becomes clear. They ain't gonna make it. Pilots are now gliding towards Winnipeg. I can only imagine how eerie the lack of noise inside the airplane must have felt. It's already become abundantly clear that Winnipeg isn't a realistic option. That's when First Officer Quintental remembers something. He used to be stationed at an old Air Force base in Gimli, about 12 miles closer than Winnipeg. Now this Air Force base had been decommissioned for years, but at this point, any strip of pavement beats a forest or the Canadian Rockies. What they don't know? Parts of the base have been converted into a drag racing strip. And on this particular day, Saturday, it's packed with spectators, cars, kids, and lawn chairs. You see, this is why I never work weekends. I don't think you really work at all, Big Mac. But yeah, nothing ruins a Saturday like a 767 trying to land on top of you. 
And up in the cockpit, we're too busy trying to keep the airplane stable to know any of that. The pilots radio in a mayday, but communication is limited. And with most of their electrical systems dead, and it being 1983, they had no idea there were people at Gimli. With no engines and no autopilot, everything's manual and most systems aren't working. This is a situation that 99.9% .9 of pilots will never face in their career. It's not like landing a Cessna at your local grass strip. This is a 132 ton glider with no second chance if you overshoot. As they line up for their approach, they realize they're coming in too high and too fast. So Captain Pearson pulls out a move that's rarely seen outside of flight demonstrations, side slip. A side slip is where you cross control the airplane, rudder one way, ailerons the other, and you drop the plane like a falling brick. It's one of the only ways to bleed off altitude and speed in a big jet, but it's also extremely risky. Uh Correct me if I'm wrong, but ain't that a bad idea in a sweat wing jet? Absolutely. Side slipping a commercial jet is extremely dangerous because it can cause asymmetrical stall or loss of control. This can roll the aircraft unexpectedly, a bad combo, especially when you're close to the ground. You see, this is why pilots don't need therapy. They just terrify themselves professionally. Honestly, you're not wrong. So now the crew's committed to Gimli. They're coming in hot, too high and too fast. As they lost both engines, they also lost hydraulic power and subsequently their ability to slow the plane down with flaps and slats. Flaps and slats allow the aircraft to increase their rate of descent and reduce their stall speed. It's hard to understate the challenge this presents, even with the most experienced pilot. Thankfully, the gear can be lowered by gravity assist, but in this case, the nose gear didn't lock. This would actually turn out to be beneficial. Let's remember, the plane is dead quiet. So while they're sweating bullets in the cockpit, trying to land a 767 with no power, people on the ground are just enjoying a nice little Saturday, totally unaware that they're about to be featured in an unscheduled air show. As the plane gets closer, the pilots could actually see kids riding bikes within a thousand feet of their touchdown zone. But it's too late to wave it off because this is their only shot. They're all in. As the plane touches down, the mains hit first. And as Captain Pearson breaks hard, two of the 10 tires blow out quickly. Then the nose gear, which failed to lock, collapses. The nose slams on the tarmac, bounces once, then scrapes violently along the runway, throwing up sparks. But that friction probably saved lives, because right down the center of that runway was a guardrail, left over from the drag strip setup. And as Pearson braked hard, the main landing gear straddled the rail, causing more friction. This single move kept the aircraft straight, slowed it down even more, and more importantly, kept it out of the crowd. The aircraft finally came to a stop just 800 feet short of the spectators. 17 minutes after their engines had quit, they were finally at a full stop. And somehow, no one on board or on the ground was seriously injured. Well, a few people in the back had some minor injuries. Since the nose gear had collapsed, the tail was sticking up higher than usual. And when people jumped down into the rear evacuation slides, they came down fast. They got some minor bruises and rope burns. Considering they just glided a plane 80 miles with no power, it's basically a group discount on trauma. And while the passengers are evacuating and trying to figure out what just happened, a bunch of drag racers show up with the pit crew and they knock out a small fire near the nose. I mean, that's pretty good. Ran out of fuel, dodged kids, landed in a car shell, blew out tires, scraped the nose, and still stuck the landing. I mean, that's a good point, Big Mac. The guy basically parked a flying office building on a racetrack without hurting anyone. I've seen worse landings at DFW. They had all their engines. So now the plane is sitting on the runway with its giant 7.6 ass in the air, pop tires, and drag racers putting out fires. People are in shock. Not just the passengers, but Air Canada's like, the fuck is this a boot? This was a brand new Boeing 767, and it just ran out of fuel because somebody did math wrong? Well, the investigation started quickly, and the first question is, how does a jet like this just not get enough gas? Let's rewind to Ottawa. Remember how I said the fuel gauge wasn't working, allowed under the MEL? Well, that's where everything fell apart. They measured fuel in liters, then converted that number into pounds instead of kilograms. One wrong unit, and they loaded less than half the fuel the aircraft actually needed. Jet fuel has different densities depending on temperature, but at the time, the correct version factor should have been kilograms per liter. They used pounds per liter, a holdover from Canada's switch to metric, and no one cross-checked it. This could have been a disaster. What happened to the pilots? Captain Pearson was actually demoted for six months. First Officer Quentin Tall was suspended for two weeks along with three maintenance workers. Even though they literally saved everyone on board, they were punished. Later, Pearson and Quintental appealed and won. They returned to the flight line in 1985. Both were awarded the first ever Fédération Aéronautique Internationale Diplôme for Outstanding Airmanship. What is that, French? 
I think it's Canadian French, but yes. Do you know what a French person and a ping pong ball have in common? No. What? If you smack them hard enough, you'll get some English out of them. <laughs> we ran the same scenario in simulators with other experienced crews, and every single one of them crashed. And how about the plane? It was temporarily repaired at Gimli and flown out just two days later. Man, I'd love to see the ferry permit for that one. Yeah, me too. So the 767 didn't just survive. It got patched up, dusted off, flew again two days later, like, hey, you just scraped your face on the racetrack, but uh, back to work. The aircraft went back into regular service like nothing ever happened, and it also flew for another 25 years. I mean, that's not bad for a plane that almost turned into a fireball. Well, Big Mac, they were out of fuel, remember? So it could have crashed, but there probably wouldn't have been a fireball. Uh oh. Its final flight was in 2008, Montreal to Tucson. And get this, Pearsons and Quintental were on board. Like, hey, remember that time we almost died in this thing? Let's ride it one last time for nostalgia. And this part's funny. They tried to auction off a plane, as in, would you like to own the legendary Gimli glider? Starting price, 2.75 million. Highest bid, 425,000. No sale. So in 2014, they scrapped it, chopped it up, turned it into luggage tags. I mean, I ain't no finance bro, but ain't 425K better than scrap metal? I would think so. Regardless, the Gimli glider is now keychains for travel nerds. You can literally carry a piece of the plane that skidded through the Canadian drag strip for about $30. In 2017, Gimli opened up a museum because even if the plane's gone, the story is still very much alive. So yeah, it's the Gimli glider, a math air, a dead jet, and one of the wildest landings in aviation history. I'm Gary B, that's Big Mac. If you like this one, make sure to hit that like button, share and subscribe for more stories. Also, if you'd like exclusive content, I just started a Patreon with a ton of new perks. So until next time, stay safe.